talk today is, has, is the topic of when social issues do not matter in technical debates and when they do. Uh, about uh, the format will be something like a scientific research report. I will tell you the question and the realm of the problem, a suggested solution, some theory behind that, and a conclusion. And then I'll argue for some benefits of that conclusion. Sorry, I really did think that I would have a presentation slide for you. Uh, so about me. Uh, from a combination of social uh, cooperatives, political action, performance art, uh, critical theory, <coughs> study groups, and also through urban planning, uh, research through College of Urban and Public Affairs in Portland, Oregon. I put together a research project looking at the question of how do you decide what is best together in a horizontally governed organization? So it's policy setting. And how do you set policy rationally and with good reasoning when there's no one in charge to say, this is the goal, meet it. But when you have many people deciding what they think should be best. So there is a concern in urban planning about citizen participation, that is it even rational? Can you even do that? Is it the people with the largest guns and the most money that make the decision? So in 2005, I finished, I'm sorry to say, embarrassed to say, 360 page dissertation comparing the theory of Jurgen Habermas's uh, theory of communicative action about practical reasoning in democracy and comparing that to the evaluations of good process in intentional communities where people with equal formal power in an organization were able to govern uh, their housing associations. And these were very elderly. I didn't realize I was going to be studying elderly people, but I did want to know people who had been doing it for the longest period of time with the most capital they were controlling together as a group. And I asked them, how do you idealize good process? How do you make these decisions together? When do you think it's going well? When do you think it's not going well? And I compared that to my understanding of Habermas's theory, which was very uh, influential and talked about in urban planning at the time, but people were saying, it's impossible, it's impractical, you can't use it in real life situations. I said, no, I think I have seen this in real situations in my background. So when I presented the idea of this talk, I said, I, when I see technical forum debates, I often see a meta argument there that I think other people don't see because I spent all this time thinking about that topic. And I wish someday I could present to a technical audience these ideas. And really, it's just three words. But there's a translation problem because I was talking to urban planning uh, professors of planning theory. And, uh, <laughs> and now I'm talking to you. So I've been spending a lot of time the last week and a half learning the language that's used by Debian developers to talk about the issues, what really matters, and I hope I'm translating it well, and I hope I can contribute something intellectually and socially to this organization. So the context is we want to make a policy decision, and the question is, what would be best? And are people familiar with the poster, maybe it was 2010, where there's a large picture of many processes that eventually become Debian? All the different releases, all the different teams involved, all the periods of time, and stable, and testing, and that kind of thing. And I did have a slide that said this question, what would be best? If we're trying to look through all the, and I like that poster because it's procedural. There are many, many decisions that need to be made over time. Not just about what do we think would be nice, but what do we do now, since we're all so diverse, and people have so many different uh, users. You know, Many system administrators have many different kinds of customers. They can't ask those uh, different uh, desktop users and uh, NASA users and 
military users, people who want cloud implementations and embedded device implementations, they're not going to ask those folks to come to an agreement about what operating system they need. But our system administrators of the world know how to serve this, this, these folks, and they know that the products available weren't, weren't workable. And they said, OK, we're all doing things very differently, and we have very different political and economic situations that we're working on. But we know that we need to put together something that works. And so that's how I think about Debian, is, is serving the needs of system administrators done by system administrators. And I know there are a lot more people involved than that. But that's, my, that's just a working hypothesis. So if you want, so let's say now you need a code of conduct, because not only do you need to know what would be the right software to use, you need to be able to keep your uh, association of volunteers working well together, to be able to reason out together what would be best. So you have a code of conduct. And then so one of the meta arguments I see in that is, you can't legislate to me to be nice. I'm critical. I have some ideas that are not, I think I hear people saying stupid things as if they were true, and I want to criticize them. So don't tell me to be nice. I think we lose critical intelligence that way. The other side says, but if you're rude, we ruin our community and there's nothing that we can work on together. And I'm sorry uh, to say that I think that that's an unnecessary polarization of two different ways of looking at it. In Habermas's work, he suggests we add a third category. Instead of just objective issues and subjective issues, we add intersubjective issues. So that's when, um, so an object issue is, I can state the fact that this is a computer. Someone else can say, it looks like a toy to me. <laughs> but, but between us, we can say, is that relevant? Does that matter for this conversation? And so it's this idea of a shared sense of relevance. What's the goal? What would be best? What's normal? You, know, you, don't, know, you don't see your own sense of what's culturally normal until somebody walks through the room with a different sense of it. Right? Fish don't see the water. You know, until they're out of the water and realize they miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Promising body language, but I don't see the visualization yet. <laughs> Ready for the desktop. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you want to make an objective, when you want to uh, have a, a rational debate about <laughs> about uh, objective truth, there are tests that we have for that. People say this is true, someone else challenges the truth, and there are various tests you can use to verify whether it's true or not. Mm. <laughs> Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> You know, I'm, very, I'm much better at spontaneity than at practice talk, so that might have been the best intro I could have done. The whole scientific report thing, that's a picture of me on a spinning wheel when I'm 90 years old. That's the title of my uh, dissertation, that also had a long title. That's that beautiful picture I told you about. Very complicated, but it's beautiful. Procedural. Ah, this is a problem. So, use your imaginations here. <laughs> what I'm doing here is saying that there are three, three questions. One is the object that three people are in the middle of. One is the black, we have three black boxes. One is, what is this object? The black box. What goes in, what comes out? The black box. The other question is the black box of in my head. Do you know what I'm thinking and what my personal experience is? It's you can only guess. 118%, maybe it should be 100. Oh, yeah, there was a little a percentage in that window right there. So we have three 
black boxes. So in order to learn what is inside someone's head is different than understanding what the facts of the matter are, and it's, and it's different than understanding what's the most appropriate norm in this context. And so this is the little uh, gooey, I mean, <laughs> this little graphical representation of the question. One, the object, objective uh, question, two, the subjective question, and three, the intersubjective question. It's two people's heads, and if you're outside it, it looks very strange. <laughs> but if you're inside it, you might not see it at all. So one of the questions, in a way you can say that the topic of the talk is how to be able to decide together what the water we fish will swim in will be, instead of making it invisible. How do we do that together?
in these ways as well. Validity, subjective validity and intersubjective validity are also testable. So I mentioned about democracy. So in order to put an object on the moon, we share facts, we challenge them, we validate them, and then we can predict and control things. Problem is we also predict and control people, and we'd like to change that. What do you do with subjective experience? How do you challenge, or how do you test and validate the subjective reports you get from people about how things are working for them? You do that with time. You do that with uh, history. You do that with an older version of the file than I planned on. Okay, so what I, the, another version of this file it has the heads all being question marks, and then over time, you get to know someone, and you know that when they report, this is what I saw, and this is what I think, yeah, you take it with a grain of salt, you kind of interpret where they're coming from, and you're able to use their information in your world. And that only happens through time. It only happens through interacting with each other uh, and, and being able to report. And I think it's similar to a scientific experiments where in order to report your results, you need to tell somebody else what your observation equipment was and how you calibrated it. Otherwise, the numbers are meaningless. You have to know who's observing and under what uh, situation with what goals. Similarly, in a social context, and by the way, we can just say, Object, personal, and social are the three terms. Might make it easier. So what about the social context, the intersubjective context, where we have understandings between sentient beings, <laughs> like these socially constructed ideas? It's really similar. You, if um, A really mundane example I like to use is, mm, people who raise children will understand this, you, you, we have a table here, and if three of us are sitting around this table, there will always be norms. We'll always be shared understandings of what's appropriate at this table, and that norm will change in the context. Yeah. So when it's a dinner table, it's different than when it's a work table. And we learn these things. So it's not like you can say you want to get rid of all norms and all shoulds. It's more like, let's be more conscious of what they are and realize what impact they have on the, these so-called objective questions. And don't be scared about all those words and try to read them all. But here they come. When we're talking about normative questions, they could be any one of these. Have you chosen the right language? Are you speaking slow enough so the person listening to you can understand? Do you, are you being polite so the person doesn't shut down and freeze and stop listening because they can't stand it? Do you really think that you are making a decision with someone who is not part of the communication? So those are kind of language and communication issues, but there are also issues like, yes, that's the policy, but does it apply in this case? Or, no, that's not the policy, but maybe it should be. And we test these things differently. We say, what would be the impact on others if we had this be the policy? What would be the, the impact on ourselves? And how do you learn that? You learn that through history. People report, well, in my experience, when I was in this kind of circumstance, this is the impact it had on me and mine and ours when this policy was implemented in our case. And then you can, as a human being, you think in terms of stories and you extrapolate and say, oh, this might apply to us too. And these things are fairly just normal ways of thinking. <coughs> I think the important part for folks trying to make policy decisions together horizontally <coughs> is um, that norms are, are important, that we always use them, but that we can, I like Habermas's way of saying traditionally received norms versus communicatively achieved norms. Uh, is this something that uh, might be appropriate in a society that has very young uh, mortality rates, uh, where uh, uh, you learn from your father, father's father's father, you pass things on, there's not much time for reestablishing new agreements, or you're in a survival situation where you have to have everybody working by the same rules, but sometimes you have the comfort and the resources to sit back and say, how would we like things to be? 
and how would we like to do things better? And that's when it's communicatively achieved norms, where you get to know each other and understand the impacts of your actions and what might be better in the future. Is anyone holding the time cards? Well, can I expect one to go up at some point? No, I think the answer is Thank you. So if I made a three by three table and said one was object, personal experience, objectivity, personal experience, and social context, then the other row, the other column on the, I say that's title across the book on one side, and the other axis was, um, oh, that's what this one is, is make a claim, challenge a claim, validate a claim, which we've already talked about here, and. I personally, when I'm teaching facilitation or consensus-based project management to community development students, I think of these things. When I observe a board of directors trying to make a decision together, and I see a person mistakenly giving the wrong fact and being attacked as if they're being insincere, <coughs> a liar. Or when uh, someone it doesn't realize the context, they're saying something inappropriate, and they defend it because it's true. These are unnecessary conflicts that a little moderating, uh, helpful interjection from someone who is recognizing <coughs> the problem. You don't need to be part of the um, fight, but you can help reframe the question. Something to think about later. I don't think anybody needs to figure all this table out right this minute. So if you're going to do that and be a moderator um, or to have these kinds of conversations, it takes energy, it takes resources, it takes time. You need to create a place where it is a safe place to have a conflict. Where people who have very, very important points to make in a context that's very high stakes that might make a big difference, have a safe place to explain their differences in a way where they will walk out alive and be able to pursue what's best for them in the future. And continue to cooperate. And there's a slide missing in here I wish I had put, and that was that um, the reason, one of the reasons why I believe that Debian is, um, is, is an appropriate context for the application of this theory is that Habermas was saying that the, the situation that he had in mind, let me get off this slide while I'm talking. Um, the context is, the action has stopped. It's a diverse community of people with their separate interests. Uh, there's, they've stopped the action and they're committed to using a rational argument to come up with a, a decision on what would be best in a way that would allow them all to continue their action uh, with less conflict. So we have voluntary participation, we have a commitment to rationality, we have the question of what would be best, and I'm really fascinated how Debian does this, and it's been really great getting to know folks better and understand what, how our people are coming from us. I added this on at the end, after, um, I, had, I gave a version of this talk before uh, Seattle New Linux, and I didn't offer a conclusion before, I just offered a method for thinking about it. But actually, this week, it, it's been really interesting thinking, and I think I have a tentative conclusion for a conversation. And maybe what we can say is that social issues do not matter in technical debates when subjective and intersubjective assumptions are clarified. When the perspective of the speaker and the social context are, the assumptions are understood, then we can understand and contribute to the objective debate. So think of this, of this use case. Um, what is your response if I tell you the answer is 42? <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> From the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, this is, computer works forever to figure out the answer. By the time it comes up with the answer, the people can't remember the question anymore. Uh, so I'm suggesting here that in order to understand the answers, we have to understand from what, pers from what experiential perspective and in what social context. What is the goal and from what angle are you talking?
So again, you don't have to read this wall of text. You probably will anyway. Uh, <laughs> remember from mathematics or physics or any science course you ever took, they said clarify your assumptions. Uh, thank you for the conversation with the mathematician here this week to help me think of how to say this. Um, Clarify your assumptions so we understand what do, what limited universe domain of knowledge are you talking? Are is this going to be true within? You know what was your goal? What kind of question were you trying to answer? All these kinds of assumptions help other people interpret what you're saying and decide whether they're relevant for their context. So another laboratory takes your physics results and says. Um, well, we have different environmental constraints. We can't set up the same situation, but maybe if we tweak these factors, we're considering what you did and this observational equipment, we would be able to use your work, thank you. And that's nice. Another advantage is that we improve our own assumptions by making them clear to others. Um, I'm sorry to say that uh, uh, gender issues eat my head. And so sometimes if people are getting into gender issues, I might decide not to be part of that conversation because I can't think of anything more for days. I just start cogitating on it. Um, but here's a gender example. If you're from a, a privileged group, you have blinders on because other people are taking care of problems for you. A hitchhiker's guide, do you know what a set is? From the hitch problem. Somebody else's problem. There's going to be an international, uh, intergalactic uh, bypass highway coming through, and so we're going to destroy the Earth. Uh, but, uh, and so the spaceship comes down to give the report, just for public information, just to let you know. Uh, and it lands in left field, <laughs> and nobody can see it. <laughs> it's impossible to see. It's too outside the realm. You don't see it. And so if someone's been uh, taking care of the rough edges of the world around you all the time, and you're like this, you don't see the problems other people are facing. And that's the problem. It's the blinders of privilege. Uh, and so if you make your assumptions known, you're going to open yourself up to challenges you didn't have before. But it's because you're allowing other people to use your code. And they're going to modify your code and suggest improvements on it and feed it back to the same community you're working in. Um, it's not a very graceful ending, but that's really all I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, thank you. I was wondering if you had any suggestions for how to, um, when you're having a conversation with someone and you suspect that uh, that you're not on the same frame, you're not on the same page. Um, how do you how do you start to peel that back to get to um, understanding? You know what the assumptions are. Like, what's a graceful way to ask the other person to, you know, like, oh wait, uh, you've gone way past, and we need to go back. Yeah. Kind of thing. It's so specific. It has to be in the context, in a very specific context. So. You're right, the statement of stepping back is good because then what's stepping back? You might get a perspective of not two people, me talking to you, mm -hmm. but I get a third perspective, kind of objectify it, triangulate it, and look at, oh, look at these two people talking and seeing, is it a question that they don't speak the same language, mm -hmm. that they come from different cultural assumptions, and each one will be different. If they just don't trust each other, you can help those two people gain some common ground and understand, oh, this person kind of understands who I am. So if you want to help two people with having, having that problem, yeah. you can help them have some nice social beer together or whatever their favorite addiction is. It's something that they can bond around. Have a problem they solve together, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas if it's a different norm, and then they can start understanding the different, or like, what's the agenda topic here is a question. <laughs> what are we supposed to be talking about, right? Yeah. And then when it's the facts of the issue, it might be in what context, what, what, how does, what, what are you doing with those facts? I don't know, it's not very yeah, no, specific. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the, your, I think that your talk is primarily focused on 
when in situations where you're tending to achieve a goal of of agreeing on a way forward around something either social or technical, um, which is certainly one of the big things that people do inside project discussions. But I think an, there's another one that's kind of become more common as we've all tried to create a more welcoming community, which is to have there be a goal of of policing the bounds or policing the rules that we want to apply to everyone in all situations regardless. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm listening to this, I'm trying to figure out, like, because I feel like sometimes those two are in conflict. Like in order to reach an agreement with this one person, I need to kind of ignore the way they're presenting things or redirect into a different, to a focus on, a, on an issue. But in order to preserve the overall community in which that conversation is embedded, there feels like there should be some statement that this is not an acceptable way to present a point. How do you reconcile those, like in real time in a conversation? It feels very hard. It, it's very hard. We're human beings. It's really hard work. And the people who are doing it don't always get the benefits. The benefits. So um, often, you know, if I just, um, hmm. I decided personally when I was divorced and on my own with no money, basically homeless for a month or so, that uh, 1979, that uh, I had been building houses in the woods, doing construction, you know, in a homestead, and I was uh, also doing house care. And so I looked at all the jobs that were available to me. And uh, the boy work, doing using tools and construction and just getting things done was much easier and paid better. Uh, the work of making sure that the crying doesn't disturb somebody's concentration is hugely difficult work. And I think that's what happens in a community like this. It's one person's having an emotional issue with another person and you're trying to get some work done. Who does the work of trying to smooth that out? It's not invisible anymore. People in Debian now are old enough to have children and families and have to take care of each other. It's not just a bunk bunch of macho folks fighting it out to be cool, you know? So. I know in poetry circles, if people are really quiet when you're done, it's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> really, the intention is that people can think about it and talk about it later, and when policy decisions need to be made, or when the question comes up is, do we even want to make policy together? You know, it'll just be ideas and food for thought of ways to move forward. One of, one of, in my experience, which has uh, frequently throughout my adult life been with co ops, workers' co ops, food co ops, housing co ops, but also in regular institutions, um, the issue of the time that it takes to work through the um, the little conflicts that you've described very, very well uh, in meetings um, uh, uh, results from different people's expectations of expediency. We've got work to do. We can't talk about this issue now. We've got deadlines and so on. Yet, it's much more likely in a co-op that people are going to um, take the time to in my experience, and we take the time to work out what used to be called the interpersonal, the interpersonal, and so on. The kinds of dynamics that I think, again, you've described very well. Um, but when you take an overall look at that, what you're, what you're seeing is, is uh, hierarchical situations that don't deal with that yeah. are, are more efficient. I think in they economic terms, less. we can talk about it in terms of transaction costs. You know, if you want to change the way everything is done, you're talking about changing uh, the cultural milieu we've been working in for millennia, or not, or hundreds of years, uh, or change, change the government, or change uh, power structures. It's hard work, and it has a large transaction cost. And sometimes um, you can talk about objective issues and not deal with these things if you have someone just setting this is the context, here's where everybody's perspective is supposed to come from, Go for it, give me the results. If it's not any good, you're out of here too. And so that's um, much more efficient in terms of predicting and controlling a particular domain of things. 
and sometimes that's the best way to get things done. On the other hand, because we don't have the skills in how to make decisions together, things are much harder that don't need to be so hard. I remember someone telling the story of uh, having been trained in consensus decision making in groups, like co-ops, and then being out in a situation where they're trying to protect a natural resource and having a military force coming up the hill. And, and they look at each other and say, um, thank you. Uh, what do we do? We promised we would stay here. But because they are good at process, they can each say what they thought, look and see which concern to address, decide what to do, and leave. <laughs> and it was, you know, they might have just run anyway. But the point is that, um, or another story is an elderly man uh, who used to be a uh, high position in ACLU, I think he was president in the 50s? I forget what era it was, but he was in almost 90 when I interviewed him in, uh, in the 90s, in our 90s. So um, he said that he was hired uh, because of his Quaker background uh, for ACLU, and they said that they used a majority <coughs> rule, and he said, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about majority rule, I can't help you. And so they came up with a compromise because they really wanted him, and he said, I'll tell you what, um, first we'll make decisions together and then we'll vote at the end. But because he understood how to do facilitation, they always had a decision, so the vote, after a while they said, let's just get rid of this voting thing, it takes too much time. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they, weren't, they weren't tripping over each other. I mean, think of how much time it takes for someone to be hurt and for you to have to take care of them. You're just bumping off the problem to somebody else. Yeah. That sounds a little bit like what's been happening in the technical committee recently. We've in, had, what? in the technical committee, we made more decisions without even bothering with a vote than voting uh, in the last couple of years. So. I've been asking, are there people who are training each other on how to moderate forum lists? Place to start. You know, some people are better at it than others, try to learn from each other on that. Uh, thank you for your talk. You mentioned lots of concepts that I think will take time to digest, but uh, I think uh, extremely interesting. Like, even the, di the, the difference between traditionally received norms and communicatively achieved norms, which you just mentioned in passing as a, as a uh, technical like, um, uh, theory found in the, that was part of the literature you, you read, uh, is the difference between something that we tacitly always done and something we thought about and documented and agreed upon. And, uh, and as that end grows, uh, we are going from traditionally received to communicatively achieved as we hit corner cases where <coughs> habits don't work really well or cause conflict and, and then we think about it and, yeah. and we, work it, we work out what do we actually want to do and, and, and then with awareness of it we go on and move on. Um, so thank you for bringing yeah. these kind of topics to the table. I think it's part of the process of growing up of a community to think on these kind of things. I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in the cooperative movement, and I know a lot of people think of co-ops as housing co-ops or food co-ops, but uh, in truth, in the world, internationally, most co-ops are multi-million dollar operations, larger than that, uh, that carry, I think, I think if it was a nation, the cooperative activity would, economic activity, be the sixth largest nation on earth. I might have the numbers wrong, you can look up the Wikipedia perhaps. Um, but there's a lot of wisdom in there because in co-ops, uh, you assume that people can be very different and voluntarily associated um, and not compelled to cooperate. Uh, but because you've chosen one thing that serves all their needs, they're willing to cooperate on that. And that's an economic, and they might own a share, for example. So they might be producers of power. They might be co-members of a economic uh, banking and that kind of thing. It could be healthcare. And so um, 
I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, and it, it doesn't all have to be reinvented. You can actually, you know, bring in folks that have some of those skills. I want to just thank you, everybody. I've been wanting to talk about this stuff for a long time, and I know I spent a lot of time socially with everyone. I might look like just a social butterfly, but I'm also someone working on some intellectual questions when I'm talking to you. So thank you, everyone, for being so open with me.